past number of weeks, we've been studying various different images that the Bible gives of salvation. And uh, as you read through the Bible, the Bible actually describes in a whole lot of different terms uh, what it was that Jesus accomplished on the cross. And uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at another, what I'd like to call, image of salvation. And uh, what I'd like to have you do is turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Um, if you didn't bring your own Bibles along, you can find some of the Bibles that we have in the chairs around you. Uh, if you turn to page 833, you're going to find the passage that we're going to be looking at today. I think it's really going to help you, especially today. We're going to look at a couple of passages, not just this one, to have a Bible in front of you. So uh, we do here at Sunlight encourage you to, uh, to be reading along as, as we study together. Um, this morning as we read, we're going to start in verse 19 of chapter 1. Uh, this was a letter written by the Apostle Paul in verses 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul, when speaking about salvation, is going to start with this huge idea about what it is that Jesus accomplished. In Paul's mind, it, it, it involves all of creation, the entire universe. And there is this huge thing that uh, God is accomplishing through Jesus on the cross. And, and we're going to start with that big idea. And then what we'll see is that Paul says that that same huge thing that God is doing throughout the entire universe, he, he now then is going to turn and apply that to each one of us. So uh, join me. We're going to start, as I said, in verse 19, uh, beginning with this just grand, huge picture of what it is that God is accomplishing through Jesus in the entire universe. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And the him there is Jesus. So the idea is that God was pleased in Jesus to, to have all his fullness, the entirety of his deity, dwell in Jesus. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Paul says that what happened here on the cross Actually, there's this huge, large scope that uh, Paul says God had in mind, and that includes these, these words, all things. And I think as he writes these words, all things, he has the entire universe in mind because he says, whether things on earth or things in heaven, so that what God was doing through the cross of Jesus was, had the scope of the entire universe, the whole cosmos in mind, and he uses this particular verb here, and through him, verse 20, to reconcile to himself all things. That verb reconcile means something like to put back together. And um, I think the picture, if you can get in your mind, is something like this, that this entire universe as a result of sin is broken. Like things in this universe are just all out of whack. Um, all of us realize as we just look around and we have this profound sense like, you know what? Things are not the way they're supposed to be. Anywhere I look. And uh, maybe if you can just picture, if I was to hold like this huge piece of pottery in my hands and just smash it against the ground, there would be all these pieces that scattered everywhere. And the picture is God taking those individual pieces and putting it back together. And the idea is that the universe is like that. It's just broken, torn, fragmented, segmented. And God, what he's doing through Jesus on the cross is reconciling all things, putting it all back together. So it's as though God is taking all the pieces in the universe and putting it back together the way it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? So that's this big idea. He, basically, the, the entire universe is out of whack. It's all broken, torn, fragmented. And God's down there in the trenches through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. He's putting it all back together. Now Paul takes this huge idea and he applies it to each one of us. Look with me at verse 21. He says, once you, speaking now to Christians, so uh, you Christians, uh, individually and corporately, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you. And I just point out the same verb is used here as was used when he was talking about all things, he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in a sight without blemish and free from accusation. 
if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved by the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul uses this word gospel twice. The word gospel in the Bible simply means good news. So Paul's saying there's this good news that's being proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and here's what it is, that the same thing God's doing on this grand scale in the entire universe, picking up all the pieces and putting it back together, he's now doing in each and every one of you. You were once broken, alienated from God. You didn't have peace with him, and through the cross, God now got down, and he's putting the pieces of your life back together. And maybe the word that we used of the type of salvation that Paul is talking about here is the word holistic which means that this salvation involves every part of us. And every once in a while, if you've been around church, you may have gotten the impression that what salvation was all about is that if you put your faith in Jesus, then you get this free ticket into heaven. Kind of like, okay, you got my ticket, now I'll fly away to glory. That's not the picture that's here. The picture here is that God, when he saves us, he takes all the broken, dark, tattered pieces And slowly but surely is at work in our lives, putting it back together. And we can even make a list as we talk about this idea of salvation being holistic, of all the various different things that it involves. It involves our heart. It involves our emotions, our will, our minds, our intellect, even our past. It involves our wounds, our failures, our worries, our anxieties, our addictions, even our compulsions. Like every part of us. There's no part of us that God is going to leave broken, lying there. He's taking all of us, all our wounds, all our failures, all our past, all those broken pieces, and slowly but surely God is at work reconciling them, bringing them all back together. And what he's doing in the universe more largely, he's doing in each one of us. And so when Paul mentions the good news of the gospel, of what Jesus is accomplishing through his cross, he has in mind that in the life of every Christian, God is at work putting us back together the way we're intended to be. Now as we think about this whole idea of this kind of holistic salvation, the wholeness that Jesus wants to bring to us, there's a couple of passages in the scripture that I think are very illustrative of this. They're just pointed out very well. And I think as we read these stories of people that God worked in their lives, maybe, maybe we'll identify and find our own story in that as well. The first place that I'd have you turn with me is to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis chapter 25. I don't know uh, what your impression of the Bible is, but I, I think it's easy to get the impression that... Um, When the Bible speaks about people, especially the patriarchs and the prophets and the apostles, these were like people who had it all together. And sometimes we call these people like heroes of faith and we put them up on a pedestal like, man, those were people who who they had it together and if only I could be like them. And what I intend to show you today is that that's not the case at all. I mean, the people that God used in the Bible were, were just as broken, just as hurting, had just as many rough edges And the story of Scripture is is not of what great people they were, but what a great God we have that that worked in lives and and started putting the pieces of lives back together. I'm sure you've heard of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're they're often called the patriarchs of of our faith. Uh, We're going to zero in today on the story of Jacob, and I want you to see how God was at work in in this man's life. Uh, I'll begin reading um, in verse 19 of chapter 25. I invite you to read along. It says, this is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. This is, by the way, kind of one of the the stories that we find again and again in Scripture, that that there are these couples who, although they desire to have children, find that they're not able to, and and God in some way answers prayers and, and intervenes. It says in verse 22, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So apparently when she finally does become pregnant, the pregnancy is just bizarre. 
Like she can feel the babies within her fighting each other. And she's like, God, what is this? And uh, he answers in verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger and the, than the other. And I want you to catch this phrase, the older will serve the younger. The reason I want you to catch this phrase, the older will serve the younger, is that this older, younger uh, issue is going to become a theme that just reverberates throughout Jacob's life. Uh, it's interesting, even as the story goes forward, that the names that Isaac and Rebekah give to these children wind up being very, very significant. Uh, so in verse 24, it says, When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first one to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Uh, that name is, is actually a significant name. People in the Bible often named their children with, with what they saw, and when they saw this child come out all hairy and red, uh, the, the name Esau actually means hairy, and so they give him the name Harry. Um, by the way, also throughout the Bible, his uh, nickname is Edom. Uh, Edom in Hebrew means red. So uh, here's this child, they gave him the name Harry, and they gave him the nickname Red. Uh, some of you also have suffered with horrible names and nicknames that you didn't choose. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, but here's Harry, who sometimes goes by Red. And uh, now his brother, in verse 26, after this, his brother came out, and his hand grasping Esau's heel. Um, I don't know exactly how to picture this. I was present when my wife gave birth to each of our three children, but we didn't have any twins. But I guess in this case, when these twins were born, actually the younger one in some way or another must have been grabbing his brother's heel, and his parents saw that. And it says here, so he was named Jacob. And in Hebrew, the name Jacob literally means he who grasps the heel, uh, which is kind of a funny name to, to give a kid. But uh, if your brother is hairy and goes by red, it's not that strange. Now, one interesting thing about this name, I mean, actually probably sad for Jacob. Um, in English, we have this where certain phrases kind of take on a connotation or meaning of their own. The, the name, he who grasped the heel, to grasp someone's heel had the connotation of someone who was a deceiver. And I don't know if you can picture this, but the idea is this, that someone who's a deceiver, who wants to manipulate or trick others, what they'll do is they'll sort of sneak behind someone, and when they're not looking, grab their heel and trip them. And uh, that's the name they give to this boy. So uh, when people heard his name, what went into their mind is, this guy's a deceiver. Hey, what's your name? Deceiver. I mean, so, so Harry and his brother, Deceiver. Uh, strange names, but as we start to read this story, actually, they begin to live up to their, their names, what they were called. So before they spoke their first word or cried their first cry or exerted their will to make their first action, already there's some history where God has already said the older is going to serve the younger, and they've been given these names that are going to play out in their lives. For instance, at the end of 25, chapter 25, it so happened that one of the important things was uh, birthright. If you were the oldest, you would expect to receive an inheritance from your father, and so you had this certain birthright. And one time when Esau was out hunting, he came back, and he was super hungry, and Jacob had a stew that he had made there. And uh, Jacob deceives his brother for the first time, tricks him into selling his birthright. And he said, man, I'm so hungry. Give me some of your food. And he's like, well, first, I'll give you this food if, if I get your birthright. And he's like, whatever, just give me the food. And uh, that's the first time where we see this man living up to his name, Deceiver. He tricks his brother into uh, getting the birthright. And, and now just kind of page forward to chapter 27. There's this episode. I mean, it's very famous, if you know anything about the life of Jacob, very famous in his life. Isaac, the father, is starting to get old. He's going blind. And it's time for the father to pass down his blessing. And in the culture of that day, what would happen is that the father, he, 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 he had experienced the blessings of God, and now symbolically, he would want to give that to his oldest son so that the blessings he had would now pass down to the son. So the time came for him to do that. He knew he was getting up there in age, and it was now time. He calls his son Esau, and he says, Esau, why don't you go hunt down some game for me and make that food I really like, and then I'm going to give you my blessing. 
So Esau, he goes out, he, he's going to go get food for his father, and then Rebekah and Jacob, they kind of scheme together. They see this as Jacob's chance. And so uh, I, I really don't know how to picture this in my mind, but apparently what they do is they go get like, animal skins so that Jacob will feel furry, hairy, you know, like Red, his brother. Um, and he comes in and, and he, he pretends to be his brother Esau. And I want you to look with me here at verse 18. There's this key moment where Jacob has now gone into his father. It says, he went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son, he answered. And there's this question, which is so important. The question is, who is it? Like, who are you? And Jacob now has the opportunity to say who he is. And uh, this is an important question because it's a question that's going to come up again in this narrative. And there's a good principle of Bible interpretation that you should really pay attention to the first time something was mentioned in the Bible because if, if it's a theme and it replays, the first mention is very important. So this is the first time, like, who are you? And uh, Jacob, living up to his own name, verse 19, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Here's a man who's not comfortable in his own skin, who wants to pretend to be his older brother. He doesn't accept who he is. He's striving to be someone he's not, uh, so much so that he's willing, as a deceiver, to walk right into the presence of his father and deceive him about his identity. Well, as the story goes, Isaac then pronounces a blessing on Jacob, I mean, he's been deceived. He thinks it's Esau, but it's really Jacob. Esau comes back. He can't believe his brother did this to him. He's so angry that Jacob's life is now threatened. If he doesn't get out of there soon, he's probably going to get murdered. And so Jacob has to take off. And really, there's this incident in his life now where he's going from everything he's known. I mean, he can now see his life in front of him. And now he has to, as it were, kind of plunge into the darkness. Uh, he's He's got to now like take off and, and be in exile, and he's got to go somewhere where his life is totally uncertain. And as he's taking off, uh, I just want to key you into a, a certain incident here in chapter 28. As he's taking off, God has this encounter with him that's so significant. Beginning in verse 10, he reaches this place called Bethel, and there in the night he has this dream, and he sees this staircase which goes from heaven to earth, and there are angels that are ascending and, and descending on this staircase. And I want to clue you into verse 15 because God speaks to Jacob there, and these words are so significant. He says to Jacob, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God is saying, like, basically, I've got a hold of you, Jacob. I am not going to let you go. Wherever you go, I am going to be there. I'm going to be ordering the circumstances of your life so that, so that my purposes are accomplished. And I will not let you go. I won't leave you. I am with you. And then Jacob proceeds from there. Chapter 29 is like a turning point in this whole story of Jacob's life. And... Um, what happened is he actually made it to his uncle's house. His mother's brother is a man named Laban. Uh, in a far, far off country, he arrives there, and uh, I'll kind of pick up now in verse 15 of chapter 29 if you're with me. Laban, that's his relative, said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. And I'll just clue you in here. There's an older, younger. Okay, two brothers, right, in the first story. Now we've got two sisters. We've got an older and a younger, Esau and Jacob. Now we've got an older and a younger, Leah and Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. And Jacob was in love with Rachel and she said, and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. So when Laman says, listen, uh, if you work for me, what can I give you? He's like, I want your daughter, Rachel. Like, he's just, he's in love with her. Just, I want, I'll work for you. Just give me Rachel. 
Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. He is just so enamored with this girl that he works all these seven years, but it's just, oh man, it went by so fast because he's just, wow, I get to have this woman. Verse 21, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed. I want to lie with her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when the evening came, and there's this whole light, dark stuff that's going on here too. When the evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob. And Jacob lay with her. And Laban gave his servant girl Zilpah to his daughter as her maidservant. When morning came, there was weak-eyed Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? And now catch his question. Why have you deceived me? You know what? The deceiver for the first time gets a taste of his own medicine. And catch what it is. So, so Isaac's eyes are going dark, so he can't see, right? And there's this thing between the older and the younger where he thinks the older is coming in, but it's actually the younger who slips in and he can't see who it is. And Jacob, the younger, deceives the father. Here evening comes. It's getting dark, so Jacob can't see. Laban slips the older one in instead of the younger. And now this deceiver has gotten a taste of his own medicine. And now he knows what it feels like to have this done to him. And uh, as the story goes forward, Laban also then gives Rachel a, as a wife, and he has to stay and work seven more years. And there are these business deals that go wrong and all, a whole bunch of different things. And it finally comes time where God now says, okay, Jacob, pick up your family. I want you to go back to the land. And I want you to face your brother. And so Jacob takes off, and not knowing, I mean, is my brother going to kill me when I get there? What's going to happen? And uh, as fact, as he draws near, he sends some scouts out to see what's going down, and, and they bring back this report that Esau is coming out with an army, and he doesn't know what to do. And so uh, that night, uh, we'll just pick it up. Turn with me to chapter 32. He, he sends his family ahead, and, and he stays back to pray, and something happens. This, this story is so key to the entire understanding of what happened here. Verse 22 of chapter 32. That night, now you've you got to catch on here to the whole day-night kind of theme that runs through this narrative. So that night, we're kind of entering into the night. And by the way, everything that, that goes here is going to be like a, a recapitulation, a summary of everything that we just read. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions, so Jacob was left alone. You kind of now have in mind this picture when Jacob left his family all alone in the middle of the night. He heard these words from God like, I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to cling on to you. And, verse 24, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. And Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. So here's Jacob. He's alone. It's in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, this mysterious man comes out of nowhere, and they just start wrestling. Uh, and, and neither one's getting the upper hand. They're just going at it all night long. And, and Jacob's like wondering, like, who is this guy? And I can't win, and he can't win. And it just seems like they're going a the whole time. And then at the very end, as daybreak's approaching, uh, Jake gets this insight into who this is because although he, he feels like he has his equal strength, all of a sudden this man just reaches over and touches his hip and, oh! And he realizes this is no ordinary man. And in fact, later he recognizes that he's been wrestling with God. And then this man says, all right, now, daybreak's coming. Let me go. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He, he knows who it is. You've got to bless me. Now, catch the next question. Verse 27. The man asked him, what is your name? 
Remember the last time he was asked that question? What did he respond? I'm Esau. But then he's gone. He's had to live up to, man, this is who I am. This is what deceit feels like. You know, the same thing that I was doing happened to me. And now for the first time, you get the sense that here's a man who's come to terms with who he is. He's now comfortable in his own skin. And when he's asked, what is your name? He responds with just a simple word, Jacob, he answered. I'm a deceiver. That's who I am. I'm Jacob. And now look at what this man, who turns out to be God, says. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. You're not going to be called deceiver anymore, but Israel. By the way, the word Israel means he who struggles or wrestles with God. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. So he, what's your name? I'm Jacob. And it says, oh, God's like, okay, finally. Now I've got something I can work with here. Like you've come to terms with who you are in my presence. Now there's something I can work with here. You're not going to be called that anymore. From now on, your name is going to be he who wrestles with God. And uh, by the way, uh, this name Israel of course, is a name that has then been applied to all of God's people ever since. And the idea is this, that those who have a relationship with God, it's like God's grabbed hold of us and we've grabbed hold of him and he is going to work on our life, taking all those broken pieces and, and working with all our, you know, all our stuff until he's got us just where he wants us. You're not Jacob anymore. From now on, you're Israel. You've struggled with God. You've overcome you are now Israel. God, when he works salvation in our life, it's not as though he just, here, here's a ticket into heaven. I mean, he, he wants to take all those broken pieces, our family history, the things that, that are passed down to us that we weren't even responsible for, and he wants to work in us to such a way that we get comfortable in our own. Okay, this is who I am. And God, now, like, just take who I am and, and use me for your purposes. One more uh, thing I'd like to look at. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 84. By the way, uh, we finished singing this psalm not not too long ago in our worship service, and uh, it's a profound psalm. You can find it on page 420. Just start with some of the first verses. Verse 1, we're going to recognize these words immediately. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I want to key you into verse 10, especially the second half. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. So the writer of the psalm is like, look, I am content to just sit at the door and be a doorkeeper than be out there with the tents of the wicked just One day in your courts is so much better than anywhere else. I'm so happy to just be here doing what you've assigned me to do. You may not often look at this when you read the Psalms, but you'll notice that there's a little uh, uh, title underneath where it says Psalm 84. In my Bible, the, the sort of subtitle says this, for the director of music, according to Gittith. Then it says who it's written from. It says, of the sons of Korah, a psalm. I don't know if you have any sense of who the sons of Korah are. Let me just tell you the story, because I think once you hear who the sons of Korah are, when, when you hear that this person is content to be the doorkeeper, you go, whoa, that is something else. So Korah, he is uh, not a really well-known figure. He, he shows up in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers sort of chronicles uh, Israel's wandering through the desert and the wilderness. If you're familiar with, with that at all, you know that they were led by a man named Moses, And Moses had all the trouble in the world on his hands. These people were hard-hearted. They grumbled. They whined. They complained. I mean, at every turn, they're complaining about something next. I mean, he faces every kind of leadership challenge from these people. He's constantly, God, help me. I mean, just come through here a little bit for me. And uh, he's facing all these problems. Korah is actually a family member of his. He's a close relative. And uh, at some point... Korah ends up leading a rebellion against Moses. And the substance of it was this, that Aaron was Moses' right-hand man and was made the high priest. And Korah didn't like that. 
He thought he should be high priest. I should be the one right there in the presence of God in the middle of the action. Moses and Aaron, who do you think you are? Two other people kind of played prominent in this rebellion, a fellow by the name of Dathan, another one by the name of Abiram. And uh, what happened was uh, Korah and these other fellows actually went around to all the other family clans, and they went to the leaders, and they started saying, like, who is this Moses guy? Like, can you believe him? Like, he's always putting us down, and he's the one up there, and we're stuck being down here at the bottom, and will you join me? Like, let's band together. And the Bible actually says that they gathered together 250 of the most prominent leaders, and then they went and opposed Moses straight to his face. I'm going to put a scripture passage from number 16 up here on the screen so we can follow along. It says, they came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, Moses, you've gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Like, Moses, who do you think you are? Like, what about us? And, and, and deep in Korah's heart, like, he's the one who wants to be there in the center, right? I should be the guy. Like, who do you think you are? The Bible says when Moses heard this from his own relative, he just fell with his face to the ground. He prays to God, and then he gets up. He says, listen, let's just let God sort this out. Moses is a man who didn't want this job in the first place. When God told him to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, Moses was like, hey, find somebody else, God. And like, he didn't want this. And uh, he's like, hey, let's just let God sort this out. And so God has this process they go through where they, they all come in with censers in their hand into the tabernacle with incense burning. And uh, Moses says, hey, God's going to sort all this out. As far as I can tell reading through the Bible, God's punishment of Korah's rebellion is the most swift, decisive, memorable, immediate punishment that I can you know, wrap my mind around in the whole Bible. In fact, uh, in verses 31 through 33, we read this, that the ground under them split apart, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them with all their households and all Korah's men and all their possessions. They went down alive into the grave. By the way, the word grave here is the Hebrew word sheol. It often gets translated hell. It's like God couldn't even wait for them to die before they needed to go straight to hell. With everything they owned, the earth closed over them and they perished and they were gone from the community. I don't know if, <laughs> like, what's that like to be standing there that day? The ground just like, Row! they're gone. And... Um, it says here that, that all their household went with them, and, and that's true for Datham and Abiram. But if you continue reading through the Bible, you'll just get this little hint that, that with regard to Korah, there were a couple of his sons that God decided to spare. They were left alive. In fact, I'll put a verse up here from Numbers chapter 26, 11. It says, the line of Korah, however, did not die out. He had just these couple of sons. Now, you know, kind of group dynamic. You're the son of Korah. And uh, your dad was such an evil guy that God couldn't even wait to kill him to send him to hell. And everyone watched it. You know, how, what's the group dynamic among your peers like now? People going to be good friends with you, kind of cozy up to you? I mean, I'm sure there must have been this incredible shame, guilt. Like, whoa, what my father did was like so... I mean, just you got to kind of get yourself in their shoes. So as you read through the Bible, they just kind of disappear until there's a certain individual whose name is Elkanah. And he happens to marry this young gal named Hannah. And as it turns out, she can't have children. She's barren. She's totally upset about it. She goes into the tabernacle one day to pray. She's just crying out to God. The Bible says God heard her cries, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and his name was Samuel. Sound that name familiar to you, Samuel? Samuel, then because Hannah had cried out in the temple, he was dedicated to the temple service. And actually what's interesting here is so, so Korah, the thing he wanted to be was right there in the action in the temple. And as you read about Samuel's life, he then became the priest who was in God's presence and was the anointed one. I mean, it's very interesting. Samuel then has some sons, and those sons have some sons. So Samuel's 
grandchildren. And if you want to go looking for it, it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 6. It turns out that David, when he builds the temple, he selects these grandsons of Samuel and says, you guys are going to be the musicians that are going to like be in charge of the worship life of Israel. And he actually sets them out in front of the gates of the temple so that when people come to worship the Lord, they like enter in with their music, these grandsons of Samuel. And um, actually, it's interesting, as you read through the Bible, there are 11 psalms that were composed by these grandsons of Samuel. And uh, I don't know about you, but those, one of those so- psalms is Psalm 84, the one we just read. You know, we said it's from the sons of Korah. That's what they call themselves, sons of Korah. Like, I don't know about you, but if I have my grandfather is like the great Samuel, and then my great, 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 great grandfather is Korah, and I want to introduce myself to somebody, I'm probably going to like, hey, I'm the son of, well, who? Samuel, right? Like, nice to meet you. Like, my grandfather, Samuel, that's right. <laughs> you know, but, but that's not it. You know, they go around, they introduce themselves as who? The sons of Korah. It's like they know from whom they came. Which, now, you read this verse, verse 10. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. They're just totally content to serve even the smallest purposes if they can be in God's presence and fulfilling his purposes. See, God, all through these generations, he's been at work, and, and, and there were these horrible broken pieces that he's now started to put back together and he's worked in these men's lives in such a way that like you know what i'm content to just stand right here at the door and be singing praises to god and i just think it's awesome that like christians all over the world gather together and they use the words of these sons of korah to praise their god because when we gather together we don't we don't have to come pretending we're We're not who we really are. Put on some kind of mask and act all fake like, you know what, I've got it all together. I'm a perfect person. And One of the the implications is the good news of the gospel is we can just be absolutely who we are. Broken people who have no ability to fix ourselves, clinging to the cross of Jesus because he's done what we could never do. He's picking up the broken pieces of our life and slowly but surely, by his power and his power alone, he's putting us back together. Our deepest worries, our anxieties, our failures, our fears, our sins that we can't even forgive ourselves for, much less admit to anyone else. God is taking all those things and he's just taking those broken pieces and slowly but surely making us into the vessel he intends us to be. If you're a person who is yet to, to experience this and turn your life over to Jesus, I just want you to know that that's what Jesus is all about and this is what God wants for you. And I'd ask you to consider, if you're a person who right now you walk through these doors and you can just admit like, man, I got these broken pieces in my life, I'd ask you to consider whether, whether turning your life over to Jesus is something that you ought not to do. We're going to close out our service today singing a song that we've been singing the last few weeks. It's a song, Hosanna. And I'd like to just, as we sing that song, say a little bit about this word, Hosanna. It's one of the more interesting words which we use in worship. Uh, The word itself comes from Hebrew, and it means, Lord, save us. Hosanna, Lord, save us. And it's an interesting word because it's one of the words that's used as an ascription of praise, like Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the King of Kings. And we say it out as an acclamation of praise to God, but at the same time we say it, it's like this deep petition, like God, save us. Like take our hearts and purify us and put our lives, like save us, God. And so as we sing the song of praise and acclamation to God, From the bottom of our hearts as well, just know that we cling to him because he's the only one who can take those broken pieces of our life and and put them back together. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that as we walk through these doors today, we don't have to pretend to be someone we're not. Put on a mask and play that we've got it all together. We admit that we don't. 
And we're here worshiping you today, crying out Hosanna, a, a song of praise to you, but at the same time, the deepest desire of our heart, that you would save us and put back the broken pieces of our life. Work in us, take those dark places, those tattered places, those torn places, and mend them and fix them and, and put us back together. We cling to you and cling to the good news of the cross and pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.